Hello, and welcome to the TIFF podcast, where we explore the world of public health, interviewing registrars, academics, and leaders in the profession. My name is Kazim Bibijan, and I'm a specialty registrar in public health in the UK. The aim of this podcast is to offer a wide panoramic of what it means to work in public health, while hopefully providing some inspiration to those who would like to train in the profession. Great. So today it's my pleasure to be joined by Professor Kevin Fenton, current president of the Faculty of Public Health and Public Health Director for for London. Professor Fenton has worked in a range of senior public health leadership roles in his career, including being the director for the National Centre for HIV, STDs and TB Prevention at the US CDC, followed by the National Director role for Health and Wellbeing at the former Public Health England. And he was also recently awarded a CBE in the 2022 New Year's Honours list for services to public health. Kevin, it's a a pleasure to welcome you and thank you so much for for joining us. Thank you so much. It really is a pleasure to be here with you as well. And I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Well, I think we'll first start with the most important question. We're two weeks into uh, into January at the time of recording. Did you did you manage to have a, a Christmas break? I know many of us have had disrupted Christmases over the last couple of years. Did you manage to get time to recharge? Well, absolutely. And I think this is really a priority for me and, and my family this year, actually, because actually it's been three Christmases and New Year's that have been sort of, um, we haven't been able to disconnect completely and uh, spending that time both away from London and away from the work and being able to just reflect on the amazing and challenging and complex year 22 was, but also to begin mentally to prepare ourselves for what will also be another challenging and hopefully exciting year in 23 was exactly what the doctor ordered. So I've returned refreshed and we have an exciting program of work that we're developing for the faculty for the year ahead but also the public health system and how it continues to evolve and meet the challenges that we're currently grappling with, I think will be both an exciting and a challenging part of our work for 2023. So yes, hopefully you also managed to get a break and I know many of my colleagues are rearing to go for the year ahead. I did, yes, yeah, great to, to hear that you, you have found some time to, to to recharge. I mean, you mentioned there about some of the challenges ahead. I mean, mm-hmm. to start the conversation, I know the Faculty of Public Health recently celebrated its 50th anniversary and published a really interesting collection of papers reflecting on half a century of, of public health and what the next 50 years may bring. And yourself and Maggie Ray, your predecessor, co-wrote the foreword to that uh, collections. And I, I wonder, what are, what are your sort of reflections on the achievements of the, the faculty over the last 50 years and its role in, in, in public health going forward? I must begin by saying just what a privilege it is to take the, the helm of the presidency from Maggie Ray, who's a dear friend and colleague but also to be part of the leadership of this fantastic organization and to be celebrating 50 years. And when I look back at the 50 years, there are a number of core themes that are recurrent and uh, in a sense, expanding as we move forward in time. You know, our commitment to quality training and development of public health practitioners here in the UK and more recently globally, whether through our curricula, through examinations or CPD programs, and the ways in which we are recognizing and supporting the next generation of public health trainees gives me hope that we will continue to play that unique role in the system of both safeguarding the training of our public health practitioners, but also supporting them along their career. Over the 50 years, we've taken on a successive range of big policy agendas, both responding to emergent and current threats, but also keeping our eye through environmental scanning on the big items which not only public health practitioners, but the nation, the society, the health and care system need to be concerned about. And being that voice of clarity, being that voice of evidence into policy and action that the system needs. And that was as true as it was in the 1970s as it is today, as we're taking on issues of climate change, the cost of living crisis, the role of prevention in the NHS, and the future of the public health workforce. 
And then finally, I think because we're a standard setting organization and really supporting our practitioners, when we look back over the 50 years, we've seen so much transformation and change in the health and care systems in all of the UK nations, but especially in England. So the faculty's ability to be that rock, that foundation on which allows for change to take place, but to keep that laser-like focus on why we need public health practitioners, how we make a difference in society, and to ensure we're fully integrated into the new systems are as important today as they were 50 years ago. So that those are some core and recurrent themes for us as a faculty. Now, over time, I think we have clearly demonstrated a drumbeat on tackling inequalities. We've clearly demonstrated our ability to think through incorporating partnerships with people within public health and outside of public health, and we'll continue to grow that. And finally, really ensuring that we're not only focused in the UK, but also contributing to global public health training and capacity development as well. So I think the story of the 50 years, I think, are built upon those core themes and accomplishments, and they really put us in good stead for the next 50 years. Thanks. For, thanks, that, Kevin. So it was it was really yeah, interesting for me to read through those those papers. They really had some really introspective sort of reflection on the role of FPH over the last 50 years. And from a registrar, registrar perspective, it does feel as though public health as a field is going through a bit of a reflective and, and transformative period. You know, ADPH recently celebrated their 175th anniversary and, and published a series of essays, which we've discussed in a, a previous episode. But it seems like the last two years or so over the pandemic has really shaken the, the, the profession from, from top to bottom. And I know we have the, the COVID-19 inquiry ongoing, which many um, public health leaders and organisations will be uh, contributing to. But within the the sort of public health family, I think we probably identified some some lessons learnt already. But for, from your perspective, from your role in the pandemic, what what do you think are the key mistakes and lessons learnt from the pandemic? Mm. You know, there are going to be a number of lessons arising from the pandemic, and the inquiry will certainly provide a structured way of reviewing those lessons. Uh, in my own practice, working with a system in London, we've been shifting the narrative to think about what are the lessons and the legacies of the pandemic. Because it's one thing to learn, but it's another thing to change behaviours to ensure that we're actually um, building upon those lessons and generating lasting change as a result of our experience of going through the pandemic. And I challenge my colleagues in saying, in five years' time, when members of the public, uh, when our core partners say to us, what did we do differently as a result of going through COVID-19? We can hand on heart say, you know, the way we do business now with our communities, the way we use data, the way we uh, plan across sectors has fundamentally changed because of COVID-19. So I think there are five legacies that you'll hear me constantly reflecting on and creating a drumbeat here in London and nationally as well. The pandemic really taught us about the importance of having a well-resourced, equity-focused system that is uh, the, the appropriate investment in pandemic preparedness, but also that we have the sort of infrastructure which is fit for purpose to respond to emergencies and to do so in a more joined up way. So ensuring that we have robust systems, partnership working and systems working and systems leadership in place. The second is ensuring that we build upon the amazing partnerships that we developed in the pandemic. For me as a public health practitioner, I have strong relationships now with our VCS communities, the business sector, with uh, a range of departments within local authorities beyond the public health teams, from planning, adult social services and others. And that depth and engagement on public health and the placement of public health deeper in relationships, I think, has to be a legacy. And in London, working with the mayor of London, locking in that commitment that everything we do will have well-being and a focus on equity as part of the work that we do. A third area is data. You know, we demonstrated that we can do so much in sharing data, developing data sets, looking at a range of data sources and integrating them 
in order to both target interventions and to evaluate the impact of the interventions. And to be able to see that done in real time for both the testing and contact tracing, and then more recently with the COVID vaccination program, suggests that we should be bringing that expertise to helping us to tackle some of the other big public health issues that we have. You know, at the peak of the pandemic, I could tell you where we had very low rates of COVID vaccine uptake, high rates of disease, and where we had outreach services, COVID buses and vaccination sites within a kilometer of where we needed to focus. And we're able to leverage that data with our local authority and NHS partners to do targeted interventions. We've proven that we're able to do that, and I'm hoping that that will be a legacy for us as well. And then finally, two other legacies that we're working on, research. Um, the types of research, the types of data that we use to both characterize the epidemiology, to evaluate our community-centered responses. We were integrating polling data with clinical data, with epidemiological data, to really characterize populations in London, where we focus our efforts, how we tackle inequalities. And that use of qualitative and a range of quantitative data showed us the richness of that integration. Again, the public health thinking, but also working with our population health experts in the NHS, as well as uh, others who are able to come to the table to say, how do we understand what's happening in London? And is London OK? Really helped us to think differently about data. And I would never end in speaking about legacy without mentioning the importance of community-centered approaches to this work. We could not have got through the last two and a half years without engaging our voluntary and community sector agencies, valuing them, funding them, supporting them. We developed community champions across the city, COVID ambassadors, who are now being trained to be community health workers. We're leaving a legacy of a new field force of community workers across the city, which are now taking on issues of chronic disease prevention, promoting vaccinations and vaccine equity, and really helping to engage with our communities. And so that commitment, I think, is the fifth and final one from the pandemic that we'd be keen to see here in London. And I'm sure these are the conversations that are being held nationwide as well. The fifth point you were talking about engaging with communities. So I was fortunate enough to be able to attend the UK Health Security Agency Conference last year. And from a registrar perspective, it was really, you know, fascinating to hear the reflections of, of so many public health leaders from across the set across the system on the lessons learned from the pandemic. And I remember clearly, you know, you spoke very passionately about the importance of engaging with communities as a key lesson learned from from the pandemic. And you spoke that as public health professionals, we have a sort of of contract with these communities who were particularly those worst hit by the pandemic to do better and you use the sort of phrase we know more therefore we must do more what did you sort of mean by this contract um mm -hmm. with communities and and what do you think better engagement with those communities looks like you know what there are many moments and many stories that I tell of my experience in the pandemic. And one of the ones that will forever be etched in my mind is when we began doing our outreach on the COVID vaccine and we were working with communities across the city to engage them and educate them about this emerging vaccine. So we knew hesitancy would be a problem in London because <laughs> it is for other adult vaccinations. So we weren't going to wait until COVID vaccines were available. We started our engagement exercises before the first vaccine was given. And it was really important. And I'll never forget this because it was uh, in Westminster. It was a, a town hall event, a very old Caribbean man called, I would call him Jim said, Doc, thank you for telling us all this information about the vaccine. But the question I have for you is, why have you never come and spoken to us about any other topic before? And then the second question, if I get this vaccine, will we ever see you again? Because in my community, these are the things that we're worried about, and we're not having these kinds of conversations, and we'd love to be able to have this with you. And it was an amazing moment because everybody on the call said, this is exactly what we have wanted for the dialogue between you, public servants, people working in health and ourselves to talk about the big health issues. Know that you need us for the vaccine you're coming to us, but will you leave us behind? Will you forget us when this is all over? And that is a contract 
that I'm speaking about when I say when we know better, we must do better because it is because we were able to have those authentic conversations. You know, when we started this journey, vaccine hesitancy rates in London were sky high. There were communities that would not touch the vaccine. And through deep engagement, setting up the infrastructure with community ambassadors and community health workers and a range of outreach, culturally competent programming, we were able to change that effectively and resulted in high uptake levels, certainly for the first vaccine and the booster. And so, but those of us working in London, and I know for many of us who are at the forefront, we want to build on that relationship that we have. And that's really difficult because we're dealing with a health and care system under stress. And when systems and organizations are under stress, we often revert to type. And unfortunately, the type that we might refer to is becoming more closed in our leadership, becoming more command and control, and becoming more reductionist in what needs to be delivered. And often what gets left behind are things such as dealing with equity, engaging with communities, building trust and confidence, and improving culturally competent access. So that contract is about ensuring that despite the pressures that we're facing today, and we see it as we're going through this winter, that we still keep that desire and that commitment to working with our communities to continue to build the trust that we've gained over the pandemic and to ensure that we build in and lock in the sort of ways of working, which I think will put us in much better stead as we do post-pandemic recovery and we restart our services. And that's what I think it's key, and I think public health practitioners have a key role to play in health and care systems to ensure that we keep that laser-like focus on that part of our programming as well. We won't treat our way out of the NHS crisis, but it will require us to bring our communities along to be partners in how we use services, how we manage the pressures, and ultimately how we build resilience in our communities. The point you made about authentic engagement was really really powerful and just touching on your your point there that you made about keeping the momentum going with the lessons learned from from the pandemic so Mm -hmm. we had maggie uh, ray your your predecessor on in a previous episode and we we touched on her thoughts about whether she thinks we are prepared for for the inevitable you know next pandemic at at some point in, in the future and she mentioned that actually a number of the key lessons learned from from the pandemic were similar to those identified from the H1N1 epidemic in 2009, uh, you know, regarding the lack of PPE and testing capacity, for, for example. It, you know, you've worked in multiple roles across multiple countries and multiple epidemics. I guess across your career in, in the US and the UK, what do you think the challenges are in maintaining that momentum that you you spoke about and reducing that risk of forgetting the lessons learned from for COVID-19? Great question and it's what we're actively involved in now in terms of ensuring that we avoid that you know leaving the lessons behind. So the first is reframing as I've done previously and I said previously from lessons to legacies so that for the lessons that we're learning, we think about what structural change, what cultural change, and what behavioral change we want to implement so that we lock in that learning as quickly as possible. Uh, so a good example of that is in London, we had done so much great work on vaccine equity. We were able to work with the NHS to fund a COVID vaccine legacy program, a two-year initiative where we've invested monies to both capture the lessons of the vaccination program and then to apply those lessons both to other adult vaccines and to the screening programs because the same factors of trust, engagement, empowerment, literacy affect these public health programs and we now want to work with our communities and bring those lessons across as well. The second thing that we need to do is to ensure that as these uh, reviews and inquiries are being done on uh, the pandemic, that we do have and take the time as systems to reflect on the learning, reflect on the recommendations and to challenge ourselves about are we growing and learning and assuring ourselves that true change is taking place. And we have time and space to do that. Uh, Certainly in our systems here, we have done that periodic check-ins as a leadership team to ensure that 
uh, we continue to evolve and to develop and learn together, build that trust across leadership. And that's done both within the NHS and through the Resilience Forum across London's various health and care and other partners involved in London Resilience. The third thing that we're committing to doing is looking at the challenges that we're facing here and now and in real time and ensuring that we continue a process of continuing it continuous improvement and, and, and continuous improvement and delivery. So in the last year, in a post-pandemic, and I use that in inverted commas, world, we've had to deal with the MPOX outbreak, polio in the water system in London, uh, flu, uh, a resurgence of COVID, uh, the Group A strep, and a variety of other infectious disease threats in the space of 12 months. And that has meant that a number of the key ways in which we've worked, how do you get an incident management team together? How do you leverage resources from partners? How do you deliver vaccines in real time? And how do you scale up and engage a population? We've been having to do that throughout continuously. For each of these, one of the things we're putting in place is that we do do after action reviews to say, are we getting better at managing these? Because if we get better at managing these, smaller but equally impactful events, it means that our skills, the way we work together, we were communicating continually are tested and we're locking in the learning as well. So three things that we're doing, I think, in the city, and I know speaking to my other regional counterparts, that's exactly the way we need to be thinking that, you know, you can't prepare for a Big Bang event by only practicing at the time of the Big Bang event but using every opportunity you have to ensure that the core principles of an effective response are both reflected on and implemented and used, and then doing the after action reviews in the spirit of continuous development and improvement. I mean, just thinking back to the point I made about the UK Health Security uh, Conference and reflecting back on the on the pandemic, I feel that may be something that was under discussed, particularly in our, our profession, and it's quite a blurry relationship between politics and public health. Yeah. And going back to the the foreword that you co-wrote um, about the on the FPH 50th, 50th anniversary collection, you mentioned about the the policy and advocacy function of FPH. And I, I'm sure you probably agree that our profession is probably one of the most political of the medical specialties. How would you characterize the relationship between politics and public health? And given that you've had a number of different roles across you know, different organizations, how easy have you found it across these different roles to be able to hold the government to account on particular public health issues? So the first thing to reflect on is that there's not one kind of relationship between public health and politics. And in fact, it depends on the administration in power, it depends on the core values, it depends on the threats and issues that you're faced with at any given time, uh, the priorities which are set by politicians, and what in a sense needs to be achieved. So I'm always mindful when this issue comes up to say to colleagues, there's no one-to-one -one relationship here, um, and that there's a an agility and a dynamism that we need as practitioners, both to understand the population health need, to advocate for the population health need, but to understand both the timing, the opportunity, as well as the mechanisms for working with politicians in order to advance those agendas. Now, there are some key things that we must have in our toolkit in order to operate effectively. So we need to understand our advocacy and political skills, working with politicians, briefing politicians, and so forth. Second, we need to understand what's in our toolkit and to ensure we have robust data and evidence to support the policies and the programs that we are recommending. Third, to understand and to, un to understand the data that we have and the evidence that we have to justify asking politicians to prioritize a particular intervention and to recognize the trade-offs that politicians will need to make in order to tackle a particular activity. So anything we're gonna ask, whether it's asking schools to have more time for physical education or increase the age of sales for tobacco or to remove more sugar out of the food we eat, they will have other ramifications that politicians will have to consider before making a public health decision. And this means it requires from us both a humility in understanding that we're not the only game in town, but also 
a robustness in our arguments and the evidence which underpin our arguments in order to make our case and recognizing the contingencies with other areas. And I say this because oftentimes for colleagues who are not working closely with politicians, it is sometimes feel that it's simply a matter of, you know, saying this is the right thing to do and you must do it. But having worked with local politicians, I work with the mayor of London, national politicians, you realize that at any given time, there are a number of decisions and choices that need to be made. And your role is to provide both the best advice, the best evidence to think about how you can facilitate implementation and mitigate negative consequences of that choice. That's the sort of holistic thinking which I think is needed. Finally, there's something for me about, and I say this to my team in London all the time, we're working in a complex adaptive system and in fact we're working with many different systems. So there's a humility in understanding what is uniquely within our control and what we can influence. And there is a clarity in understanding what our roles and responsibilities are. And for both of those things, those which are in our control and our roles and responsibility, do them well. In other words, in a complex system, understand what you're supposed to do, do it well and deliver it. Thirdly, in a complex system, ensure that you create fantastic partnerships. Be understand where the movers and shakers build those relationships. And fourth, be clear about the things that you want to achieve and to look for the opportunities when they appear, because the complexity means that, you know, there may be a story at six o'clock on the news on, you know, a death from eye gas. And all of a sudden, there's an opportunity for us to move forward with an intervention on early childhood education or childhood vaccinations. And then that's a time to engage politicians to say, actually, here's how we may be part of that. So some of those core competences of how to work with politicians, but then how to understand timing and uh, how to land your arguments and what you need, I think brings us into a much more sophisticated and I hope a much more effective way of working with politics rather than what's often seen as I have the data and the evidence and you must listen to me. That's really fascinating uh, Kevin thanks thanks for that especially on the point you made about agility and those trade-offs and having the right timing with with um, with those interventions. So I think as public health registrars we are you know it's drilled into us about change dealing with organizational change dealing with changing in public health system and I think one example of of, of possible that the influence of politics and public health recently was the the abolishment of PHE in 2021. So you know many in public health would probably say that restructuring public health systems in the UK is an expected sort of cyclical uh, event that we are often quite quite used to. But there is a, another side of it which was recently presented by. Um, Professor Peter Littlejohns at King's College London, where they identified a number of lessons learned from the abolishment of PHE through through speaking to a range of, of public health leaders. I mean, just you know, given your your experience across local and national teams, how would you characterize that particular organizational change? And going forward, how do you see the role of the UK Health Security Agency? and the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities going forward? Big question. And it's also a political question as well. And the decision to uh, uh, bring PHE to a close was a political one. And I don't think it's for us to second guess the reasons why and whether it was right or the wrong thing. But what we can reflect on is, have we created a system which is better? And if we haven't, what might we do to ensure that we continue to work together to ensure we have as robust a public health system as we need in England, given the scale of the challenges that we face? So I completely celebrate the creation of UK HSA and the focus on health protection and health security. And it is key that that organization is resourced well enough to do the job that has been set out for it. 
and that we're able to ensure that in setting up this agency with this focus on health protection and security, that it both discharges its responsibilities as well, and it becomes a key system partner for improving the health and well-being of the population and tackling inequalities through working with others. So UK HSA place within the system is robust, it's valued, it's supported, and it's integrated. In England, we have to look at the other systems and structures which have been established and do a similar exercise of asking, is it fit for purpose? And if not, how do we continue to improve it moving forward? With OHID being part of government, I think there's some phenomenal opportunities for ensuring health and well-being in all policies across national government and given the national to regional to local link through regional offices for the Department of Health to be able to ensure that local considerations are brought into national policymaking and that national policymaking has a clear implementation route as well. And really exciting. All of this will require strong political leadership and engagement and commitment to the public health agenda. And we will see how OHID is able to work with ministers to achieve that. But there are other parts of the public health system that we need to knit together in the absence of PHE. Public health in the NHS is stronger now. We have more public health people that have moved back into the NHS. That needs to be better coordinated, better supported, and to ensure we're supporting practitioners in the NHS as best as we can. And of course, public health in local authorities, which transitioned in 2012, 2013, continues to be that focal point for local delivery and impact. And it's important that we build the lessons on the lessons from the pandemic on local public health but also strengthen the work of integration vertically from local to national, but also within place horizontally as well. How do we work effectively across public health partners in place to achieve population health outcomes? So we are where we are with the system that we have. As leaders in the system now, the question is, how do we make this work? And how do we continue to advocate for further tweaks to the model so that we can have that laser-like focus on improving population health? Those are the questions that I'm focused on as president of the faculty and working with leaders of our organizations to make sure we do this. Great, thanks, Kevin. That's a re really important perspective, you know, focusing on how we can knit together the different parts of the, the public health system that we currently have. So I guess one thing that's really drilled into us as registrars is that we need to have the ability to influence and bring people together from across the system. And, you know, you spoke about this many times about the importance of valuable partnerships across the, the public health system. So I was wondering, what, what are your tips to those currently training in public health across the system about how they can develop their influencing and negotiating skills? You know, I cannot underscore enough the importance of developing those relational skills as early in your career and to invest the time and effort to refine and develop those skills. And when I look at my back at my own career, it's been a combination of getting the experience. So throwing myself into situations where I'm bringing people together, practicing and learning about systems leadership and the techniques which are required to be a good and effective systems leader. So doing the training to do that, but also combining that with putting myself forward to develop and take advantage of opportunities to do and implement those skills, right? So bringing groups together, focusing on strategy development, focusing on program delivery and implementation, working with partners on resolving knotty issues when it comes to improving the population's health and tackling health inequalities. So if I look back over the course of my career, it's been that combination of learning and refining the skill set, but also committing to implementing it. And so a key part of this skill is recognizing its centrality when you're operating in complex adaptive systems. Because the system that we're operating in has many partners, with partners having individual and organizational priorities, with any given, at any given point, there are multiple issues that we're managing concurrently, which will require both prioritization, coordination, and collaboration in order to resolve them. It just demonstrates how critical developing good partnership skills are. 
deals like these don't happen overnight, right? They start with the small programs that you have when you are in your training program and you're asked to develop a project, your ability to convene stakeholders from different backgrounds and disciplines to problem solve, problem identification, problem solve, and to deliver your solutions. It then gets refined and evolved as you become more mature in your leadership and in your public health practice. So in summary, three things I would suggest to colleagues listening when it comes to developing these skills. Number one, recognizing that to be an effective public health leader, this in addition to some other core domains of communication and leadership, but partnership working is one of the ones that you must invest in and become expert in to be effective. Number two, Nothing comes natural in these skill sets. You have to learn, you have to practice, and you have to take the hard knocks of throwing yourself forward to doing difficult partnership work and learning how to be to manage robust partnerships. And finally, look at who's doing really good partnership work. Model some of the behaviors that you see in others. You may have a supervisor or a colleague or another person in your organization who you see is doing particularly excellent work in this space. What are the leadership characteristics they're bringing to the role? What are some of the skills that they're using to bring to this role? How are they managing partnerships both within the and around the meeting table? But what happens away from the meeting table that allows for effective partnership working when you're actually around the table? Um, what are the things, soft and hard qualities, which are required for you to be effective in this space? I think are some of the things that I would do. And for people who work with me, I often invite them to shadow me to see how I operate in the diversity of partnerships and system leadership fora that I have to run, manage, either to be a leader in or to be a, a follower in throughout the course of my day. A lot of the work that I do is achieved through effective partnerships and being able to be a good leader or a good follower are skills that I've developed over time. Great. Thank, thanks, Kevin. That's really, yeah, really fascinating. I mean, on, on the point you made about observing your seniors and leaders in, in the field, have there been any particular sort of mentors over your career that you've really admired their their, their style of, of negotiating and bringing people together that, that you've sort of taken on in, in your career? Oh, absolutely. I, I'm a collector of good leadership practice whenever I see it, because I'm always excited about leadership anyway. Right? It's something that I really value. And when I see great leadership, I try to emulate it. But I also try to say, well, what is it about that person that really inspires me, that challenges my thinking about leadership? What are the skills that they're bringing to the table, which are new? which perhaps I haven't yet developed, or that I see would actually add value to my own leadership repertoire. And to have the opportunity to have a conversation with them about how they view leadership, the values that they're bringing to the role, um, the skill sets that they're using, has certainly helped me throughout my career. So my mentors are varied. Um, they include community advocates from my early work on HIV because they taught me about the power of narrative and storytelling and the ability to be relentless in advocacy. I've learned from my uh, professors who taught me to be a good academic and epidemiologist and who instilled in me the rigor that was required to both publish and write and to present um, because I saw really good examples of that happening and I learned how to do it. More recently, the kind of leadership that I both aspire to is not only around transformational leadership, but also visionary leadership as well. So looking at whether it's people like Barack Obama who have had the pleasure of meeting and, and and serving with when I was in the United States and being able to say, actually, what is it about this leader that resonates so deeply with me? And what is it about my skill sets that I'd like to develop will be key. Finally, recognizing that oftentimes there's skill sets that I want to develop, which may not be in the textbook of public health leadership, but which have been critical in helping me to be effective. So as I mentioned, being a good storyteller, has been one. Second, being able to connect with people and to provide that respectful air to people who I'm working with. So whether you're a community organizer straight through to a minister of state, to be able to 
actively listen, actively engage to understand another person's perspective and priority and to work through them. I've been working with mentors in order to help me to do and develop some of those skills. So, as I said, I'm probably a collector of good leadership behaviours. Uh, and part of that is active listening and active observation of my peers and of people who I work with uh, and a reflection on my own practice to see how I might improve. You mentioned there a bit about storytelling and sort of the way you explain public health concepts or deal with the media, for example. So I think many, many people in public health may know you from your presence on social media, for example. And I, I feel like that's really fascinating and that there isn't a lot of public health leaders who engage in that way on social media. So I was sort of wondering, why why do you think social media is important in public health? And, and what's the approach you take in your thinking to engagement on, on, on those types of platforms? I've always viewed effective communication as a core skill set to be an effective public health um, practitioner and leader. And it comes back to the mentors and the models that I had early in my own career, where whether it was the chief medical officer, Liam Donaldson, colleagues working at UNAIDS and WHO at the CDC, their ability um, to not only operate in a technical, a highly technical space, but to translate the technical into the hearts and minds, to connect with listeners, to inspire listeners, and to change hearts and minds, really resulted in some of the movements in public health, but also the changes that we were seeking. It has always been a core part, I think, of understanding what else I need in my toolkit to be an effective practitioner. As we move into much more complex spaces, and again in complex environments, we're at any given stage. For example, a day like today, I've had meetings with colleagues from the NHS, from national government, from business, community stakeholders in the call just before this. The ability to be able to, to tell that story and to bring that narrative together to simplify, clarify purpose, to inspire people who are often tired, overstretched, to focus on a matter at hand is, I think, a core skill that I bring and that we should bring as leaders in public health. Finally, we have to be effective advocates and an effective advocacy means that we need to have a number of quivers, so to speak, you know, ready to use in our bow, because we must be able to say, actually, in this environment, rather than giving something technical, I'm going to tell a story. In this environment, rather than connecting on p-values and distribution curves, I'm going to tell a story that will have a much lasting impact with the listener in order to help to change hearts and minds. And it's being able to use the diversity of tools and strategies and communications, which I find fascinating, but also which I'm content to help to develop. Now, one of the things I bring to this is humility, right? Because I'm not a marketing expert, I'm not a comms expert, I'm not a media expert, but I do take the time to both respect the professionals that I'm working with in media and comms and to learn from them. And therefore valuing them as part of the public health team has also been something I've brought to the table. And I think many of my media colleagues will say, my goodness, you know, when we work with you on a public health issue, we feel as if we're a part of the public health team. And I said, but you are, because you're bringing different skills to help us to tackle a problem. Finally, you reflected on social media, and I've just been moving into, away from Twitter, which is changing as a profile into exploring new platforms of TikTok and um, Instagram and beginning to think through different audiences and different ways of communicating and beginning to think about the narrative that we're getting through. Because I think post pandemic, the democratization and the public engagement that we've had, the polarization of uh, how people view public health, we shouldn't take for granted and to be able to connect with people in different ways and to be seen to have that authentic voice in different platforms, I think will be key for us as public health practitioners moving forward. 
So hope that helps and I hope it, it highlights just how important I place on this and, you know, investing the time and the effort and the partnerships to be able to get this right. In addition to the classic technical areas of public health is something that I've always been committed to. Re really fascinating, especially your point that you made about really integrating comms colleagues into public health projects. I think that's really you know, un under discussed how much value they they bring to the the table, and it's really interesting to to see your your approach to social media, and thinking about what next. You know, with the changes that are happening to Twitter, looking to things like Instagram, um, and I look forward to seeing how you engage on TikTok. I find I find that quite a challenging uh, platform, so I look forward to seeing that. You made a point about the renewed and increased attention on public health. I think. Since COVID-19, you know, many would have been introduced to the idea of public health through things like Number 10's COVID-19 press conferences, for example, which you spoke at a number of times. Two questions sort of on that. What was that experience like, you know, being on that, uh, you know, famous lectern and being in such a intense environment and intense moment in, in part of the pandemic when you spoke? Did, did you have a process for preparing for things like that and other media interviews? Do you have like a a step by step sort of thing that you could share with the registrars? I know a lot of registrars, you know, uh, shy away from from media oftentimes. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a principle I have in my leadership, which is anything that I'm, not, that I'm afraid of or uncertain about, I, th I run towards it and I throw myself into it because it often suggests that there's a level of discomfort and that's where learning takes place, right? So if you're not feeling discomfort, if you're not feeling, oh, I'm not sure, and you know, I feel nervous about this, that's exactly the space you want to be in because that's where you make breakthroughs. So when you see me on TV or on a podium or giving a lecture, what people often take for granted and they say, oh, it seems to come so naturally for you. You're so lucky. What people don't see are the years of media training that I've been through. That 24 hours before, I would have sat down with my media team. We would have gone through the key messaging. We know the framing. I am going into that interview with a mindfulness and a purpose on what I want to communicate. We've gone through what are some of the risks in the interview that I need to be mindful of and how I would pivot away from difficult questions or manage difficult questions. And at the end, the sort of tone and feeling that I want to transmit, whether on TV or on radio, whether that sense of calm confidence, which is the one that I often use. So I have different personas, but calm confidence and competence is the one that is my go to. Um, there are times when you want to be upbeat if I'm celebrating an accomplishment, for example, in HIV progress in England, I'll be much more animated and saying, yeah, you know, we're almost at the point of eliminating HIV and this is why everybody needs to be on board. But for most of my interactions, especially during the pandemic, it was being that steady, calm, competent voice that people could trust and that Londoners could trust. And that required preparation before. So three things. You will never see me on a podium or on TV or on the radio without preparation. Two, you'll never see me on TV or on a platform without practice. Sometimes that practice is just looking at the script beforehand, key messages. Other times it's standing in front of a mirror and practicing what I'm going to say. And third, trusting yourself that actually the experience that you have and the knowledge that you have is likely to be a lot more than any journalist is going to have. So not to be afraid of questions that will come in from left field, but trust yourself to be able to on that spot to be able to respond in that calm and confident way, because you know, you know this and you got this. And that third thing about believing and trusting yourself is key. I think most people are often afraid of these interactions because they're worried about whatever question can come from the interviewer. When you think of it, you, this is your specialty area. You're in this, you're doing this every day. It is likely that there are a few things that anybody will be able to ask that you won't be able to respond to. So the third point is trusting yourself and trusting your gut. You got this. Really interesting 
points you made there is particularly about the adaptability of personas based off the audience and the subject matter I feel like that's really 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 useful and going towards things that you fear I think yeah myself and Josh uh, hosting this podcast I think certainly from my perspective it was something that I was uh, a bit reluctant towards you know sort of putting yourself out there but um, but so far it's been been great to, to to speak to so many interesting people so that actually brings us to to the end of the episode and to end on one last question that we'd like to ask all of our guests what is your one career tip to those currently training in public health mm, it's keep learning keep learning and this is a little secret that they never tell you when you're in medical school and when you're doing your sort of masters in public health you think yeah i'm gonna have my masters or i'm gonna have my cct and that will be it no keep learning things are changing so rapidly and evolving so quickly that your commitment to learning investing in yourself seeing learning as a part of what you need to be an effective leader and seeing learning as a way to deal with imposter syndrome and seeing learning as a way to continue to be inspired and to enjoy your career as it unfolds has been one of the top tips and the best things I've done and I've invested in. And that learning doesn't have to be about the latest mathematical modeling techniques, right? For me, I will learn every year something related to leadership because it's an area of interest. So I'm keen to learn from new techniques in leadership from Harvard, from business, from other industries to see what can be applied here. I often learn something creative every year because I need to keep my mind fresh and active and to challenge myself in different ways. And finally, I often commit to doing something which is more relational and emotional and really helps me to connect better with people. Those are my choices for my leadership and my CPD. And I know each of us will have different priorities for leadership throughout our career. But that investment in yourself is wonderful. And that investment in yourself is necessary, I think, for you to continue to grow and evolve and adapt as a professional and have a fantastic career. So that would be the one thing. I'd focus on. Great. Thanks so much, Kevin. I think that's a great note to end on. And thank you so much for joining the the, the podcast and, you know, sort of pulling back the curtain a bit on, on, on public health leadership and all the hard work and approaches that you have to your own uh, professional development. So thank you so much for, for joining, Kevin, and we hope you've enjoyed the, the conversation. And uh, thanks to our listeners for, for, for tuning in. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's been great. Uh, look forward to hopefully chatting again sometime in the future. <laughs>